So going back to Nirvana for a second, when Nirvana broke, why do you think they became so big? Was it because there was never really a band like that in the mainstream before? Like, what do you think? Well, the style of the arrangement of, of the song, first of all, was copied by a thousand artists. Like, they loved the way Smells Like Teen Spirit was arranged. Start off slow and low and wind up, like, screaming. But I think that what happened was, um, the, for lack of better description, the hair metal bands were seen as kind of like pro wrestling, like fake. It wasn't real. I think why Guns N' Roses worked is because they were really heroin addicts. I think that they, they made a great record. I mean, God knows Appetite for Destruction is one of the greatest albums ever made. You know, it's spectacular. But there was an honesty to it. What creates authenticity is, is, uh, is one of these nebulous descriptions, because I don't know how to describe it. You either feel it or you don't. Most of the bands that were coming out of the hair metal genre it was were they authentic no it was the same shtick it was put on the clothes had the hair boofed out guitar player shreds the singer talks about a girl and you know everyone's drunk and partying and maybe there was no message there and i think that with uh, nirvana and pearl jam and alice in chains there was a message there and the message was more authentic people liked the the less it was less pretentious think about it you had these hair bands with loud clothing and loud hair and everything was like you know you know like the, the finger pointing and like it's like pro wrestling like yeah and then grunge was insular very hip very foreboding uh very um look down at your shoes i mean that was like the the joke you know these are shoe watchers right that so that was the response from heavy metal guys yeah they just get their shoe gazers he gave them their shoes, like being introverted. Like the Grateful Dead was an anti-image, okay? They were not image, they were anti-image, which they turned into an image. So grunge turned anti-image into an image with the plaid shirts. Next thing you know, everybody's throwing on a plaid shirt. I mean, I know these heavy metal bands in Georgia at the time. I was producing a band called Red Threat, and they were a hair band, and they converted to a grunge band called Snake Nation. They, they, took, they cut their hair, bought plaid shirts. It was like, here's a marketing plot, Right? And maybe we'll get a record deal looking like this. The same way that when the Beatles came, all the, everyone said, you got to have long hair. If you want to have a hit record now, you got to look like that. Same shit. So what do they take away from grunge? Was it the message or was it the image? A lot of times they took the image. People like the image of the plaid shirt, understated, introverted, angry, um, message-laden. Remember, 80s metal was partying. Hey, dude. And grunge was introverted and serious. I think sociologists and, and uh, psychiatrists would have a better way to explain to you why it, it took hold. Now, something, it interesting, took hold. something interesting that I, I read a little while back is for the 2010s, for that whole decade, of the top 10 songs on modern rock radio in the States, all 10 of them were released between 1991 and 1994 that three-year period, and the majority of those songs are grunge songs. So what's interesting with grunge is it has such a quick burnout, but it's had such a longevity. Why do you think that's the case? Well, I don't know. I, I All the great, the great disco songs came out in three, within three years, from 76 to 79, right? That's 99% of all disco uh liverpool released i mean think about the beatles you think about motown from 1963 to 1967 it was a golden era i think a lot of these trends tend to be golden era trends like there's just a golden era of incredible um creativity it's not just grunge you know so if you listen to um you know, if you love soul music, Motown is the is the is, is it, right? Motown is it. Motown didn't last forever. Motown lasted probably eight years, but let's say four of those years was were just unbelievable. And the Beatles were around in my life six years, from sixty four to seventy. That was it. In six years, they produced twenty two singles, twelve albums, <laughs> three movies. You, you know what I mean? It's like insane. So um, every era has a period. And then it depends on, I guess, sociologically how big 
uh, they were how 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 many people bought it because people have to want to listen to it right and mass. So grunge affected a lot of people in a very short period of time, and grunge didn't last all that long, right? Punk in England didn't last all that long. Punk in England lasted from seventy six to eighty, and every great record came out from seventy six to eighty. Every great punk album came out during that period of time. Probably say the same thing about grunge and its and its era. I am not a grunge guy. You know, it's not like I could I never got into it. Doesn't mean I don't understand and appreciate people's adher adherence to it. I just never got into it. So I don't feel it. So I can't give you an organic response like, well it's obvious because the brilliance of these guys were blah blah blah. I can't. But if you're telling me that that's the case, it's because these guys released incredibly great music in a very short period of time. Now, think about this. Great artists uh, Van Gogh says, and they were all around, you know, like a short period of time. The great uh, classical composers were around a short period of time. These were, this is emblematic of man's development artistically. And eras of great creativity are com um, are compressed by people who are affected by it deeply and can release this stuff. And why is it always like that? It's always like that. The great artists come out of this period. The great classical composers come out of this period. The great jazz artists come out of this period. The great folk artists come out of this period. The great grunge artists came out of this period. The Liverpool, you know, the, the, the British invasion lasted like, like this. You know, the Beatles were on Ed Sullivan nine times. There was one act that was on 18 times. A British rock act. That was on itself 18 times. And that wasn't the Beatles. It was the Dave Clark Five. Okay? So you say to yourself, why didn't Dave Clark Five make it the same way the Beatles made it? Why didn't Dave Clark Five, with 18 times on Ed Sullivan's show, with all the hit singles, how did they not become at least as big as the Beatles? We always think Beatles Stones, Beatles Stones, Beatles Stones. The Stones didn't have a hit until a year and a half after the Beatles had a number one hit. Do you know that? Beatles had I Want to Hold Your Hand in 1964. The Rolling Stones had Satisfaction in the summer of 65. So it was a year and a half goes by. Meanwhile, the Dave Clark Five have had single after single after single, hit after hit after hit, 18 times on the Ed Sullivan Show. The difference between the Dave Clark Five and the Beatles is that Dave Clark Five never became an album act. The Beatles morphed into an album act when you needed to morph into an album act. And with that, took all these artists into the world of making albums instead of making singles. That's what changed that scene. You could probably apply some sort of grand, um, some sort of a grand explanation as to why grunge lasted, when it lasted, and how it affected people. Why the effect of those songs were so, were so big. But I don't own any of them. I don't own a Pearl Jam record. I don't own an Alice in Chains record. I don't own a Nirvana record. They just it just never, it never resonated in me. But I certainly know that. What they did in the business, it changed everything. Now, I was I was badging a heavy metal band that immediately put on the plaid shirt. I mean, I saw it with my own eyes. Were you surprised yeah, sure. that they became as big as they did? Sorry? Were you surprised that Nirvana became as big as they did? Uh, I don't know. I can't honestly say. I don't know what makes anybody successful. Shit resonates or it doesn't. When I heard the song, I thought it was a great song. Did I think it would take over the world? Not necessarily, but who knew? I mean, who who knew? I have friends who love that shit. I mean, love it, love it, love it, and consider him one of the greatest in the world. I acknowledge he's amazing. I don't listen to him, but I acknowledge his greatness. I totally acknowledge his greatness, without a doubt. Without a doubt. I just don't listen to it very much. But there's a lot of artists I acknowledge their greatness. I don't particularly listen to them. So, J.J., when Nirvana blew up in the early 90s, Twisted Sister, of course, was already retired at that point. So the grunge explosion didn't really affect you personally. But as we all know, when grunge hit, it really took a toll on the glam scene in general. How did you feel about that situation as it was unfolding? Well, I didn't really know. I didn't really know personally how bad it was until I spoke to Vito Brada of, of uh, White Lion. And White Lion was a hot cord hair metal band. They were from Staten Island, but they were local guys, and we knew them. So I called Vito about uh, about a, this was about a year later, so like ninety two maybe, because I think Nirvana came out in ninety one. I think Smells Like Teen Spirit hit in ninety one. After I saw the Wasteland in front of me, and going, man, must be a lot of guys out of work. 
And I called Vito and I said, Vito, how you doing? He goes, I haven't touched my guitar in nine months. And I said, what do you mean? He said, I heard like Teen Spirit put my guitar down and said, it's over. And I thought, really? And he goes, dude, yeah, really. I heard Smells Like Teen Spirit. I put my guitar down and said, why would anybody care about a shredder anymore? And that was the end. Well, I was writing an article, let's be fair. I was writing an article called Hair Today, Gone Tomorrow for some rock magazine. And, and I, so I spoke to Vito and I said, what, what happened? He goes, man, I heard Smells Like Teen Spirit and I just stopped playing guitar. I said, what do you mean you stopped playing guitar? He said, I put a guitar down. And I said, I'm not playing guitar anymore. So what do you mean? He said, I didn't touch a guitar for nine months. I heard it. I said, who the hell wants a lead guitar player who shreds? They want songs. They don't want all this, you know, this diarrhea guitar stuff. So it basically put me out of business. It scared the crap out of me. I just said, why are we even here? Like, that's what the impact was. You know, if, if Quiet Riot and Motley Crue let off the genre, bands like White Lion were like the, the tail end, you know, six years later. The only band left standing was Guns N' Roses. I wasn't playing. I was still managing bands and artists and singer-songwriters when it hit. I wrote an article about this, by the way. This very quite, and I love you because you're younger, so you come upon this. It's like, I want to know the secret. I want to know, like, what is classic rock? And I already been down that road in my head. And why did, why did the dinosaurs come and wipe out? I want to get this quote correct, and I want to give it to the right person. And I think it was Janie Lane who said what I'm about to say. He was driving on the 405 freeway, through, uh, freeway in Los Angeles when, he, when KLOS played Smells Like Teen Spirit, and he pulled over, and he went, my career is over as I know. Like, why would they know that that much? Like, why would why would something be that obvious to people? Why would you just know that your career is over? So, it had an unbelievable effect and MTV changed dramatically. So, a friend of mine was an executive at MTV. So, I called her and I asked her what happened. Because I, was it the equivalent of the dinosaur, you know, of the meteor hitting, you know, the world and wiping out the dinosaur? And she said that um, you, they would sit down every Tuesday to watch videos, you know, the new videos. And, um, you know, like all these little hair bands were like little jets on a runway, you know, the next, the Atlantic jet, the Columbia jet, the Geffen jet. The, the turning point was a video called Man in the Box by Alice in Chains that totally shifted their focus away from, quote, hair bands that had dominated MTV and made Twisted Sister, Twisted Sister, or we made them. But, uh, you know, that was 84 for us. So here we are in 91. So I had a good run, six years, seven years. And then Man in the Box comes out and they look at it and they had a choice to add Man in the Box or a video by a group called Thunder. That was your typical product, typical heavy metal band hair that did all the things that hair is supposed to do and all this shit. And they were on Geffen and that was the next hyped band coming. And they looked at Thunder and they looked at Man in the Box. So Alice Jane and went, uh-uh, we're taking that. And that was a road less traveled. And it wiped out the dinosaur, which was the hair metal bands. And it kind of ended. The only band that leapfrogged and saved themselves was Guns N' Roses. And my theory is that Guns N' Roses was um, not perceived as a joke. They came out of L.A., but I think that Axel, first of all, had a great voice. Uh, uh, um, uh I think that they were perceived as real, not fake. Like really, like they were real junkies, not pretend junkies. So there's a authenticity is all about authenticity, and grunge is all about authenticity. People wanted authenticity, so they got it with grunge, and it wiped out the um, the perceived frivolousness of hair metal, which is hey man, let's party, let's get the girls and drink, and you know like. Uh. And I think people just got sick of that, and they wanted authentic. You know, that's what I think. Anyway. But you, you don't like the term hair metal, you said, right? No, I think it's a derogatory term. I use it because it makes it easy for someone to, I could say 80s metal, you know, 80s metal not here. But yeah, it's a derogatory term. You know, I mean, it's acid rock or derogatory, folk rock. I mean, everyone comes up with a, with a, with a, you know, let's label it. It's skinny tie. It's new wave. It's new wave of British heavy metal. The press always has to like do it. Let's just say that American American 80s metal is pretty much of a type. It's of a type. It looks the same. 
it sounds the same. It is the same to a non to a non fan. You know, my father used to say that everything sucked after 1945. Like all music sucked. Like he, he made it really simple. 1945 before, after, before great, after sucked. I said, how do you just dismiss 50 years? He goes, it's so easy. It's just baby, baby, baby. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's all it is. So if you don't care enough to know, you don't know, right? So if you don't care enough to know and you're a casual observer of MTV, you wouldn't know the difference in Warrant, uh, Poison, White Snake. It's all the same, right? It's all the same. But you wouldn't know the difference in 1964 if you didn't care enough to know the difference in the Beatles, Billy J. Kramer and the Dakotas, Jerry and the Pacemakers, Freddie and the Dreamers. If you didn't know and you just heard the songs on the radio and showed pictures, you, you all go, it's all the same. It's all the same. You know, this is the problem with genre, with genres as the genres move forward. You know, it's all the same. At Motown, you know, it's the same guys playing on every track. You could dismiss it as all the same. I would never do it because I know Motown. So I could tell you the difference in every singer going. But if you don't care, it all sounds the same. If you don't care about Liverpool, it all sounds the same. If you don't care about 80s metal, it's all the same. If you don't care about grunge, it's all the same. That's the problem with and country music. You know, if you don't care about country, it's all the same. What does Alan Jackson say about country music? You play a country record backwards, the girl comes back, the car comes back, and the dog comes back, you know? And that's a country guy making a joke about country. You know, I don't know what you say about an 80s metal, you know? Party dude. That's what it should just be called, party dude, right? It's everything's party dude. I mean, you know, it existed as a genre. It had a nice run, right? But things evolve all the time. I mean, you know, punk wiped out foreigner, you know, corporate rock for a while, right? Everything everything kind of goes through these these phases. I mean, disco wiped out you know, rock on radio for a while. You know, so if you're around long enough, you see these gigantic trends that come. I mean, if we sit back now with 30 years perspective on this and we look at, at the whole scale of it, you know, and – and uh, it goes to your question about classic rock, because a lot of the hair band music, um, now forget the hair band name, just say the some of the songs that became hits are classic rock hits. So it evolved into an acceptance of a certain genre of music, and some stuff survived. And, and But I think that the whole derogatory nature of the hair band moniker is not, it's not something I'm particularly happy about, because I think it degrades the bands. And, and, you know, there's good bands and there's bad bands in every genre. There's good versions and there's not so great versions of it. So, you know, there was probably some really bad grunge bands. You know, every band that came out of Liverpool was not a hit. Some survive and some don't. Nirvana. So, you know, I got to respect Kurt Cobain a great deal. I, I never, I saw them on Saturday Night Live, that fabled concert where he hit the, his head of the guitar, and I thought they sucked. I went, wow, this band can't play. Right? That was my reaction. Because we came from a hard bitten bar scene where we had to be great every night, you know? And so when I saw bands that kind of looked stoned, they kind of looked like they didn't care, and I didn't have much respect, but I got a lot of respect over time. I thought Kurt Cobain was an extraordinary songwriter and singer and deserves the, um, he deserves his legacy. One thing that Eddie Trunk said to me before was that he felt once grunge became huge and, you know, sort of pushed glam metal to the side, that it left a permanent stain on glam metal, so to speak. Eddie feels that even to this day, the grunge backlash against glam still unfairly paints glam in a negative light. Do you agree at all? To a degree, among critics, yes, but among fans, no. I mean, how could we have played in front of so many people for so many years? I mean, if it really was a backlash, you wouldn't have all these festivals built on the backs of of these kinds of bands, would you? You wouldn't. And yet, the music resonates so well and so incredibly well and matters so much to so many people. 80s was derided by critics, you know. We were as vacuous and stupid and yet they played 80s bands probably played to more human beings than anybody else previously in the history of the world. And those fans had kids and they managed to keep the popularity up. So it was redemptive to see us and all these other bands play these gigantic festivals in Europe and South America. Now in America, 
it's a different story in America. In America, no one gives a shit about this stuff. They really don't. But in South America, in Europe, in the Far East, in India, we're revered. So that means that we meant something to them that was much more important than we meant to the American average American kid. And I am extraordinarily grateful because it gave us a life. We left it. We didn't have to leave it. You know, when we started in 2003, I said to D, how long do you think this shit's going to last? Like two years? By 2006, I go, how long do you think it's going to go? Another two years? And then by 2010, is how much longer can these festivals go on? I'm sure 2012, it'll be over. And the offers got bigger. And the crowds got bigger. In 2016, during our last run of dates, we probably averaged 60,000 people a night up to 110,000 people twice. I, you know, it was mind-blowing. How big it, it was. Mind-blowing. You could, we could have kept it going, too. It didn't matter. We weren't playing a lot, right? You play 20 shows a year. You're not exactly burning yourself out, okay? But the amount of kids who love it. I don't know if Eddie Trunk has been to South America and seen how the South American kids are. They revere this music. You know, and as great as it was in Brazil, in Argentina, in, in Buenos Aires, the single, the single greatest rock audience you will ever witness in your life. If you do nothing else, go to Buenos Aires the next time a heavy metal band comes down there and plays and watch those kids. Mexico, not far behind. Mexico's got 60 Beatle cover bands. Do you know that? 60 Beatle cover bands. Do you know our number one country in Spotify is Mexico? Was it sister? Yeah. Yeah, number one country, Spotify. So it resonated. I think America has a strange prism of how to view it like a really weird prism of view. We have a whole different view of it in South America and Europe, and I'm grateful to them. And, and those fans, you should ask them. Do you think that glam bands sometimes get brushed off because of their look? Absolutely, yeah. There's an unfair backlash against Twisted Sister because of how we looked. You know, now, now we knew that that would be alienating. You know, when we finally took our makeup off, it finally allowed people to like us for just being a good rock band and not, you know, we didn't lose any of our fans and we gained people. Our fans knew who we were, but people who didn't know us would come and see the band, not see makeup, and go, oh, cool. You know, they're just a heavy metal band. Um, but the way we look definitely turned people off. What Here's what amazes me, that Motley Crue turned out to be as popular as they are. You know, I understood KISS 100%. You know, I, I understood KISS's popularity without a doubt. Motley's, I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't get it because I don't – they never – we're good, <laughs> you know, like Guns N' Roses. That was a great band, you know. Kiss was a great band. Molly's never been a great band. And yet they had, when they returned, when they sold out all those stadiums, I was like, wow, okay. They mean a lot more to people than I ever expected. I never expected them to do that. So they, they had a deeply affecting image and style and music to people. I don't get it. I really don't get it at all whereas i get 100 percent kiss i get 100 percent guns and roses i don't get motley's incredible popularity but more power to them you know just because i don't get it doesn't mean anything it's just i it's just that uh, so um it's hard it's, it's really hard to say you know i mean the public ultimately determines your 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 um I thought Twisted had no following. When Twisted came back after 9-11, and we wound up headlining for, for 14 years in Europe, and we played 100,000 people all the time, if you were to say to me, oh, you're going to come back, and you're going to be playing 100,000 people, and you're not going to take it, I want to rock, are going to be the most popular heavy metal songs in history for licensing. You know that the number one and number two song, the most licensed songs in the history of heavy metal, are not controlled by ACDC, Kiss, Guns N' Roses, it's controlled by Twisted Sister. We're not going to take it. I want to rock are the most licensed songs in history, heavy metal songs in history. Who knew that was going to be? And if you would have asked me that 20 years ago, I'd say, what's a license? I don't even know. So it's interesting to see what time does. And by the way, to all the people that hate us, well, too bad. We're not going to take it as everywhere. It's in commercials and TV shows. It's in. It's in movie soundtracks. It's everywhere because it resonates. And obviously, if you last long enough, do you know what that means, Daniel? It means you resonated. 
It means you it means you meant something to people. So obviously, motley means a lot to people, and poison means a lot to people. And, but yeah, do we get all the derision? Yeah, of course we do. You know, it's built into the cake because our music is designed. The image of youth and prettiness is not in a bunch of guys who are sixty years old with pot bellies. Okay. Whereas Crosby, Stills, and Nash look the same, you know? I mean, it just, it doesn't, Santana doesn't need to look like he did when he was 22. Clapton doesn't need to look like he does when he was 22. Unfortunately for bands like us that were so visualized, forever have that kind of goofy rock persona, which David Lee Roth, by the way, exemplified in Van Halen, but they were saved by Sammy Hagar, Okay a much more serious musician. So Eddie didn't have to just sit behind the goofy doofiness of David Lee Roth. He was redemptive with, with, uh, I, look, I can just go on forever with these kinds of theories, but, but that's how I view. And you're one of the few people that kind of sees these larger pictures. A lot of people say that rock is dead, but then at the same time, there's a movie like Bohemian Rhapsody a biopic about one of the biggest rock bands ever, Queen, and more specifically about one of the biggest rock stars ever, Freddie Mercury, that movie made nearly a billion dollars worldwide at a time when rock and roll is supposedly dead. And as a result of the success of Bohemian Rhapsody, Queen's popularity worldwide has grown even bigger than before. So if rock is really dead, then how could a movie about Freddie Mercury, a movie about Queen, do so well? Well, if a movie comes out about Beethoven and it's a gigantic hit, and Beethoven's been dead for 400 fucking years, no one's going out and buying classical music. So it's not, the story was compelling. The band is great. I mean, Queen is amongst the top 10 bands in the history of rock. You know, Beatles, Stones, Who's Zepp Floyd, Queen, ACDC, Sabbath. You know, they all happen to be British. Is rock dead? Well, I think you and I have had this conversation. So I'm going to repeat this for the sake of repeating it so you have it on record. When I was 17 years old, when me, when J.J. French was 17, and I went to the Fillmore East to see my heroes, I saw the Grateful Dead, Jimi Hendrix, Janis Joplin, Jefferson Airplane, Rod Stewart, Jeff Beck, um, uh, every, uh, Crosby, Stills, Nash & Young, all these superstars, right? None of them. When I was 17, none of them were older than 26, including Bob Dylan. So think about this for a second. I'm 17 years old, and these unbelievable legends, none of them are older than 26. And we're talking dozens of legends. Jim Morrison, The Doors, you know, we can go on and on and on. None of them were older. Maybe 27 at the, late, at the eldest. They were 10 years older than me. Maybe. Well, here we are, and I will tell you to name me a whole bunch of 26-year-old rock stars. Can you name them? Can you name 26-year-old rock stars to me? Can you? You can name 26-year-old country stars. You can name 26-year-old female pop artists. You can name 26-year-old rappers, hip-hop artists, but you can't name rock artists who are 26. So the problem is, is that the next generation didn't seem to come up and replace it. They did for years, but it hasn't. So if I'm wrong, tell me I'm wrong and give me examples of how I'm wrong. Give me examples of 25 incredible rock artists who are right around now who are 25 or 26 years old, who are selling records in Billboard magazine or downloads or streams or creating um, interest. You pick up any music paper, look at current trends, you never see rock mentioned anywhere. Now, that doesn't mean that rock stars who are 60 years old can't sell out stadiums. Those rock stars are not selling music. They're selling nostalgia. And that's fine because, you know, everyone's entitled to entertainment. But where's the next generation, Daniel? I'm asking you, since you asked me that question, can you name me any... 25-year-old genius rock stars out there that are burning up the world. Can you? Well, there are some great rock bands out there like Tyler Bryant and Dirty Honey, you know, Bible Sons, and they're young bands, but um, they're not selling out, obviously, the way that, you know, the bands used to. 
The one exception to that rule I would find is Greta Van Fleet. I mean, they really took off a couple of years back. There's your problem. You know, when people all bring up Greta Van Fleet, so here's the answer. That's one. The Grateful Dead, Led Zeppelin, Jeff Beck, Rod Stewart, The Faces, The Rolling Stones, The Beatles, Who, Zepp, Floyd. They're all 25 and creating the greatest music on the planet Earth. New music all day long. Churning it out. Album after album. Hit after hit overwhelming the world that's not what's happening right now so what's happening is hip-hop is everywhere uh female pop is everywhere country music is ubiquitous you know and rock is i mean you can make a case and say that country music is nothing more than 80s rock with a twang and to a degree it is the techniques used in 80s rock, the chord structures and everything are very much a part of contemporary country, bro country, they call it. But it's not being made by 25-year-old rock stars. It's made by made by 38-year-old Nashville guys, right, who, who grew up, you know, I think um, Garth Brooks was a Kiss fan, major Kiss fan. But then Garth Brooks is from New Jersey. You know, he's from South Jersey. He's not, like, from Mississippi, and yet he's the biggest selling solo. You know that Garth Brooks is the biggest selling solo artist in the history of America. Do you do know that? Oh, yeah. Beatles are number one. Garth Brooks is number two in record sales. Think about that for a second. So I just think that rock is not as, um, it's not as uh, viable. And now Muse is a really great band, right? Muse is wonderful. They're great. How old is Muse? They're 40 now, right? They're not 25-year-old geniuses they're 40 year old geniuses freaking awesome but but i mean look what they're competing against you too how old are they now 50 55 at this point right and uh, rolling stones are 75 right so 75 years old great that they can sell out you know but they're not 25 year old rock stars when i was 17 you went to the garden you saw cream saw hendrix saw zeppelin because it sells nash young yeah, it doesn't happen. So it's not the same. But everything evolves. What lesson, Daniel, did you learn by making your movie What is Classic Rock? Did you take anything away from it? Yeah, 100%. Well, first of all, my, my definition of classic rock changed. I, okay. I, I, that was one thing. I don't want to give it away because people are going to watch it. So you got to watch the movie to see that. Okay. Um, I also found it interesting that this particular point that we're talking about, which we've had several you know, dinner conversations about, about this topic. Right. Um, this is the one topic I find that everyone's kind of split on, right? There's the, you know, there's the realists like like yourself and others who point out the facts. Like, no, look, like there's nobody that's really young that's blowing up, right? And then there's the more um, hopeful people that are saying, no, no, it's going to happen, it's going to happen. So that's the one thing I found really interesting is this one point is the most contentious amongst, you know, the rock community, from my experience at least, of like, will there be another huge band? And, and and what you know what this COVID-19 may be the catalyst for something spectacular maybe maybe something will come out of this that the world's never seen before and I hope it does you know I hope it does because because the world is boring without new new music and, and new, but I have gone the other direction I've decided to discover jazz right now it's like a thing I've always been curious about like why I never got into Coltrane and Ornette Coleman and Dizzy Gillespie. I was always a blues guy, but never a blues, jazz. I didn't understand why they're considered geniuses. So I've immersed myself in jazz in, in the last uh, two months. So all I do is play jazz. At various points over the years, there have been moments of rivalry between, you know, Kiss and Swiss's sister. Interestingly, you yourself actually jammed with Gene Paul and Peter in the early 70s, and were actually at one point considered for the lead guitar position in Kiss. So given all that history, how do you feel about Kiss? A lot of Kiss fans think I didn't like Kiss for some stupid reason. They don't understand. I was at Kiss's very, very, very first performance in their loft when they played for their producer, Ron Johnson. This is this goes back to November of 1972. I saw them when they first Kissified all their songs. I was in that loft. It was just me, this guy named Ron Johnson, and a friend of mine watching Kiss. They had just changed their name and put the banner up behind them maybe a week earlier. And they were just doing these songs as a run through. And I thought they were amazing. And in 1976, Dee grabbed me and said, You got to come and see Kiss at Nassau Coliseum. 
I was blown away. I mean, they established themselves as one of the great bands, and, and until they were in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, I thought the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame had no legitimacy. Because I don't care what you think about them personally, you cannot deny the effect that they had on, on rock and rollers. In fact, I'll even go this far and say that three guitar players had the most impact on kids wanting to become rock stars. Jimi Hendrix, Eddie Van Halen, and Ace Frehley. I don't care whether you think Ace Frehley was the greatest guitar player in the world or not. His persona created more dreams for more kids than just about any other guitar player. That's how legendary he was. So I've always given him the props for being great. I'm just going on record saying it again, in case anybody asks. Hey guys, so as mentioned earlier in the video, JJ's connection with KISS goes way back to the beginnings of that band. As a matter of fact, he spent approximately two weeks rehearsing with KISS. In a conversation with Mitch LaFond, the host of the podcast Rock Talk, JJ had the following to say. By the way, we're not talking about two consecutive weeks, like 14 days. It just means over a period of a couple of weeks, I was rehearsing with KISS. So here's how it all went down. In late May of 72, I was in my apartment building in New York. I was babysitting for an attorney named Peter Thull, a very well-known music industry attorney. And I think he used to hear me play guitar out of the window because I used to play guitar in my apartment and blast it all over the neighborhood. Everybody knew that was me playing. He says to me one day in the elevator, and I was babysitting for his kid. He had a daughter, Emily, at the time that I would occasionally babysit for her as a neighbor. So he says to me, are you looking for a band? And I said, yeah, I actually am looking for a band. And then he goes, well, I'm representing an attorney named Ron Johnson who's produced a band and I'm looking for a guitar player. So they gave my number to Gene, who called me and said, I understand you're a Led Zeppelin fan, etc., etc., and we're looking for a guitar player. And I said, sure. I was 19 years old at the time, so I said, yeah, and they asked, can we see you play? And ironically enough, the first week of June, I was jamming in New York with a band named Scout, and the drummer of Scout was Don Perry, who went off to be Jethro Tull's drummer. So I go and I play, and Gene and Paul show up. They're standing at the back of the church. I walk off the stage. I walk to the back. They introduce themselves. They tell me that they're changing their name, that they have a band called Wicked Lester, that the band sounds like Looking Glass, and that they're going to change it to this other thing. They asked me if I ever heard of Slade, and at that moment, I started to hear Slade, and I was still kind of in Allman Brothers' Grateful Dead mode, and they said that they were going to follow in the lines of Slade. I didn't exactly know too much about Slade, but I said, I'm down for it. So they said, come in and rehearse with us. We'd like you to come to a session with our band, but you can't tell the guys in the band that they're being replaced because they don't know. So you're coming down as a friend. We jammed a couple of times over a couple of weeks. That's all it was. It wasn't a two-week rehearsal. It was over the course of a couple of weeks. I'd go down and jam with Gene and Paul, and I believe Peter was already recruited at the time. I could be wrong, but the bottom line was that after a couple of weeks, I never heard from them. This didn't hold JJ down, however, because later that year, in late 72, JJ established Twisted Sister. So, in terms of bands that you admire, I know that one of them is ACDC. Do you have any stories with them? You know, Brian Johnson came on stage and played with Twisted Sister um, several years ago. And at the end of the, of, this, of the show, Brian comes up and he goes, I never heard a crowd... Laddie, I'd never heard a crowd scream like that loud. And I looked at him, I said, Brian, <laughs> fuck you. I said, that's very nice that you said that, but don't, yeah, really. I mean, the crowd was great. It was a great performance, but thank you. But you didn't have to say that. But my bass player, Mark Mendoza, goes, whoa, man, my girlfriend lo loves you. Can you say hi to my girlfriend? So he calls his girlfriend up, and we're standing in the, behind the stage, and he says, Carrie, I got someone to talk to you. And she, he gives it to Brian. Brian goes, hello, darling, it's Brian Johnson. And she starts screaming, and he hands the phone back to Mark, and she says, don't you get your drunk English friends to pretend they're Brian Johnson. Fuck you and fuck him. And he goes, no, it's really Brian Johnson. Fuck you and fuck him. So anyway, we're all laughing because it's pretty funny and Brian's pretty funny. Someone sees it, walks up to Brian and says, would you call my mate for me? And Brian wound up standing there for two hours while people were lined up asking him to make a phone call to their friends. Right? So those are the kind of guys that I think are cool. 
That's so cool. Do you have any other Brian Johnson stories? Well, it's interesting that uh, the first time we got to Newcastle, Brian found out we were in town and he sent a car over for, uh, to us to hang, to, to take him to his house. Cause we, you know, we really didn't know England very well. We were on tour and it was a bank holiday weekend, which means everything was shut. And we were kind of like, you know, like in this hotel and it was dark and grimy and old and cold. And, and, and all of a sudden a van pulls up and says, Brian wants you to come to the house. And we went over to Brian's house and hung out and he ordered takeout from, uh, he ordered takeout from a local Indian restaurant. And then he said, I'm playing tonight. And he took us to this neighborhood pub, a little corner pub. And all these old guys, these grizzly guys, they look like miners out of like Game of Thrones or something. And they're all playing blues, right? But they're old guys. These are old guys, like missing teeth and cigarettes dangling out of their mouth. And Brian got up and sang and did a set with them. And the 83, we were on the Can't Stop Rock and Roll tour. Yeah, 83 was really cool. It was great. And then I've, I've had lunch with him. And yeah, I mean, when we run across each other, it's, it's fine. It's great. So in England during the early 80s, was his sister toured with Metallica for a handful of shows, correct? Yeah, we did. We did eight shows with them in Europe. And they opened, uh, it was a co-bill, but they opened seven of them and, and headlined one. They headlined the one in Amsterdam over us in Holland. Otherwise... Uh, so yeah, we did we did eight shows, and well, they also opened up for us in in a year earlier in New Jersey, at the Fountain Casino. Well, John Zazula was a Jersey guy, you know, and he signed them, and he brought them in, and I think um, we heard a bit about it when they played with us at the Fountain Casino. That was one of these clubs that held five thousand people that we were headlining in. And I looked at him with D, and I go, you, you think this is going to work? Like, we're looking at it as a marketing shtick, you know, speed metal. Like, you know, will speed metal work? We're like, eh, I don't know if speed metal will work. So I wasn't convinced that night. That night, I wasn't convinced. But when we did the tour with him through Europe, I could see where it was working. You know, and they were good. I could, I could, really, I could really see it. So going back to ACDC and Brian Johnson for a second, you know, as we all know, it's been stated by multiple sources that Brian Johnson is supposed to rejoin ACDC. But due to this, you know, unforeseen pandemic, all touring, all shows have been postponed for the time being. What do you think is going to happen when this pandemic ends? Are people going to be able to just go back to concerts or like what's going to happen exactly? I have to tell you, Twisted Sister had stopped playing, obviously, before the whole grunge thing came. So we were not wiped out with the dinosaurs, right? And Twisted Sister is now dormant during this crisis. So if we emerge at some point, we will have emerged unscathed, meaning not necessarily negatively affected. Because could you imagine all these bands and all these tours that got screwed this summer? I mean, look, uh, we know millions of them because we played with them for the last you know, seven, you know, since 2003, we've been um, with a million of these groups, White Snake and, you know, and Alice Cooper and millions of them. And they all had plans to be out this summer, which means that they spent money to put their crews together and pre-production and all that stuff. And all that's lost. All of it is lost. You know, I mean, it's tragic. I, I don't know what's going to happen. I don't know if the era of the festival is gone. You know, you look at it at some, if I look at what some of my shows, I see 100,000 people in a field. Will I ever see 100,000 people in a field again? I am, I'm finishing my book now. Okay. And um, I'm excited. This, 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 this kind of slowdown has allowed me to finish my book. And it's a business book. It's called Twisted Business. And it's about my life and, and, and how business has impacted my life and my business and the business of Twisted Sister and marketing Twisted Sister and all that stuff. And, um, uh, the book is about reinvention because Twisted Sister had to keep reinventing itself over the years. You know, there's reinvention and then there's COVID-19. Do you know that how much reinvention is going to come on because of this? I mean, in every way, uh, businesses, uh, any kind of businesses has to reinvent itself. So you have a pretty cool story you once told me about the Rolling Stones. Would you mind sharing it here? In 1965, I was 13 and, and a friend of mine in my apartment building, a girl found out the Rolling Stones were going to be at the Boat Marina on 79th Street in New York City. And it was in June of 65. So we all went down. The only song that the Stones had at the time was uh, Time Is On My Side, right? I, so that had been a kind of a little bit of a hit. But people didn't really know about it. And Satisfaction came 
right after this meeting with them. So they weren't super famous yet. So we went down and we hung out all day waiting for the Rolling Stones to come walking down off of a boat at the marina. And lo and behold, Mick and Keith walked down the gangplank. And they were, you know, we were 13 and they were 20. Boy, they're, they're seven years older than me, I think. Eight, maybe. So they're 21. They're 21. 21 year old kids. We're 13 year old kids. And we're like, whoa, Rolling Stones. They're like, whoa, somebody knows who we are. Whoa. And we had a very nice conversation. And Keith asked the girl that I was with to buy her a pack of cigarettes. I was at a being sold from a hot dog stand, which is weird because you could buy cigarettes from hot dog stands in those days, uh, hot dog sellers for 35 cents a pack. And he, she, you know, what's wrong with this picture? She's 13. She asked for a pack of cigarettes. The guy sells it to her. She hands it to Keith. Keith thanks her. They were very, very nice. You know, they, they were just really, and then the car came and picked them up or something and they left. And I was like, wow, that's really nice. And I always thought to myself, you know, if I ever made it famous, I got to remember that, you know, always because these days with social media, if you're an asshole, it used to be months before people knew you were a jerk. They know instantaneously. I just saw JJ. He was an asshole. So you don't do that. You really have to go out of your way to make sure you're really nice to people. But they were very nice before social media was a thing. They were very, very nice and very humble. But, you know, Mick and Keith, Keith has a story about Mick, which I love. And I'll leave you with that. And Keith was once asked, what's the difference between him and Mick Jagger? And he goes, well, Mick wakes up every morning and he goes, what am I doing today? What am I doing in 10 days? What am I doing in 10 weeks? What am I doing in 10 years? I wake up and go, I woke up this morning. <laughs> Keith Richards, the vampire. That's it. If had they been really bad, and we were 13, it would have destroyed our image of them, right? But they were really nice, like really nice. So I can never say anything bad because they were really, really nice. They weren't, uh, they, were, they weren't egotistical. They weren't arrogant. They were really nice. So flash forward, 2012, I'm flying from London to New York, and it happens to be a flight that got in around midnight, and Mick Jagger's on my flight. He's in first class. I'm in business class. Um, so I get off the plane, but I had a global entry, so I go through really quick. you know. So I'm through quick, and I guess Mick comes down and gets to customs or gets to the you know the guy who's questioning him, right? And he's standing. I turn around, and Mick Jagger is at the passport kiosk. And I'm thinking, man, because they were in town to play at the Barclays Center. And the guy goes, like, he's looking at his passport. And he goes, what's your name? And he has Mick Jagger. He says, what are you here for? I'm here for a concert. Now, I'm thinking, at what point is Mick going to go, don't you know who I am? Right? But he didn't. He just was like, I'm here for a concert. And then another passport guy, uh, official, a couple of things down, and goes, hey, Billy, it's Mick Jagger for the fucking Rolling Stone. Pa Stab his passport. I go, oh, and then Jagger goes, thank you. And he gave him his passport. The point was, Jagger handled it with enormous class. And um, and I thought it was kind of cool. Like, I went, wow, yeah. He wasn't one of these, you know, I'm me and you're like a peon and all that kind of stuff. I've never seen Eddie Van Halen say, I'm the greatest guitar player in the world and I'm a great person. I've never seen an interview like that. I've never seen Angus Young say, I'm the best Thing that ever lived. I've never, I've just never, for that matter, and, and when you listen to Paul McCartney, he'll go, we had a nice little band. This is the fucking Beatles he's talking about, right? And if he's really pushed, he'll go, yes, we accomplished a lot. But it, it, but the off-the-cuff line that Lennon and McCartney would go is, we had a nice little band. Well, if the Beatles had a nice little band, then the rest of us really have nothing, okay? If the Beatles had a nice little band, then okay. So if they're humble enough, how do you feel about Kurt Cobain? I didn't, I didn't know him, and, I, and he didn't live long enough for me to really understand how he was as a person. You know, I, for all I know, he could have been the worst human being on the planet, and he could have been the nicest person on the planet. I have no idea. All I know is that um, the art that he left behind, I enjoy, but I don't know anything about him as a person. So if it turns out that he was really, truly an artiste and not consumed with celebrity um you know he had the luxury of that because he was revered so when you're revered at that level you don't have to constantly say you're great other people are saying you're great that's a big difference you know you know i hate people who are 
that way and, and, and claim how great they are. So I've never seen Kurt do that. So he hasn't done it. So that's great. Because I think if he did it, uh, it would turn me, it would kind of turn me off. One of the things that I respect about Kurt Cobain is that based on conversation I've had with, you know, people who knew him and things I've read about him, it seems to me that he was much more of a down to earth person than a lot of other people who become famous. In general, I find that, you know, more so now than before, especially because of things like social media, it seems that the notion of being, you know, humble and real isn't really important. MTV Cribs did as much damage to humanity as any show I've ever seen. It it concentrated on the the material nature of 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 the of the business, and it was bullshit too, because half the stuff was made up. The guitars, the the cars were borrowed, the house wasn't their house. You know, it was a fake. It was like fake. It was like the Real Housewives. It was fake. I pitched a show to them called, I said, you want to do MTV Cribs? Why don't we do MTV Foreclosures? Which would be a two-year follow-up to those people, you know? So they, like, I could just see it now, you know? So we're staying at the house of Ice Cream. Uh, he's now living in a basement in uh, in Pensacola, having lost everything due to drugs. And I'm not going to, hello, Ice Cream, get out of here, get out of here, you know? I lost my money, I lost my money. Or we're here with, you know... Um, uh, you know, incest and the motherfuckers, like some metal band, you know, and they made, I mean, the, all these bands, all, the problem is, is that everything becomes a sideshow after a while. So, you know, when hip hop became all glitzy and glammy and minus the message, you know, so you had Tupac with a message and then you just had the yin yang twits, like you just had the, the goof. And there's always been goofy, there's goofy rock, there's goofy hip hop, and then there's serious rock and serious hip hop. And this celebrity culture business, uh, it's, it's, it's problematic, but not just in the music industry. It's the same thing with, with acting. I mean, back in the 60s, Daniel, when you saw the Academy Awards on TV, you didn't watch an hour's worth of comments over the Yves Saint Laurent dresses that the women are wearing. I mean, they were not parading around in jewelry from Tiffany or from Bul Bulgari or whatever. You know, they, they were actors showing up to get an award. Everything has become an advertisement now. and Everything has become uh, merchandisable. And now when you say to some artist, you know, what's your goal? They don't say to make a great song. It's like, well, I'm going to open up a sneaker company. I'm going to have a t-shirt company. I'm going to have a perfume. It's like, wait a minute. Isn't the focus supposed to be your art? So this commercialism that has grown exponentially from it, um, is a byproduct of media and uh and and by the way more power to anybody you know you're not selling heroin to school kids right so you have a right to market yourself any way you want it just cheapens to me what is considered the authenticity of the artist i like to think my artist is authentic if i think my artist is really just doing this as nothing more than um, another piece of merchandisable marketing i'm less enamored with the artist I've lived in the same place all my life. I think that's part of it. And where I live in New York City, the people who know me here know me as just John, you know, because they've known me for years. This JJ, I learned a long time ago that JJ French is a third person commodity to me. And while I lived it for many years within the context of the band, when I'm around here, you never can call me that. No one would ever dare call me JJ in this neighborhood because if you did, that means you don't know me. In fact, if you know me, really, you call me by my real former last name, which is Seagal. So the guys who went to school with would always, growing up, was a Yo Seagal, like you'd, you'd see on the street. And so when I hear Yo Seagal, I know it's a guy that I've known for 30, 40, 50, 50 years. Those relationships matter to me. If you look at, you know... If you look at uh, George Harris, and I'm not putting myself in that league, but what I mean is if you, if you really study artists that have been for a long time who have a lot of celebrity and you see the people around them, you see that they're with their oldest friends. Like, so George Harrison died in the home of Paul McCartney. In that's, that's not the, the purpose is not to talk about he died at Paul McCartney's house, but he was he, he but Paul let him stay at his house in L.A. And at his bedside were his wife and his son and his oldest friend, I believe, was at his bedside. Right? So, I mean, 
Um, if you look at the George Harrison uh, Scorsese movie on his final of the, the the concert they did for George, look who's in the band. It's it's Joe Brown, who was his buddy, you know, going back for years. You know, if you look at John Lennon, he brought around his buddies who he was with. You need that. Because without that, you believe all the BS that's out there. So if you're not with the people who can call you on it, then you're nothing. You know, I think Sinatra kept Dean Martin around because Dean could tell Mar- Sinatra to go fuck himself. Nobody could tell Frank to fuck himself. And Dean could tell him to go fuck yourself. And he took it. He needs it. You know, I mean, everybody kind of needs that. And I think um, for me, um, I don't have time for hero worship nonsense, especially in my own. And where I live, it's be it's both. Look, I was the president of my tenants association, so when the building converted, um, I had to defend these tenants. I was a tenant. I was a rental. I wasn't an owner. And uh, you know, most of the people are older, and I've grown up with them. And they asked me to, you know, to to um, to act as their advocate. That's a that's you that's humbling. These older people you grew up with are saying, Johnny. Help us, you know, you do it. So, I mean, it's just a personality thing. And by the way, where I live in Manhattan on the Upper West Side, there's there's famous people everywhere. We run into each, we'll bump, we say, we will always bump into each other in local supermarkets and stuff because everybody goes out to buy stuff. And if they know me or I know them, it's, hey, you know, it's like that. But nobody bothers you. Like nobody comes up to you and and talks to you anyway. You know, John Lennon, uh, horribly was killed by this moron but he did this whole interview in which he was saying he loved the west side because you walk down the street and nobody they may go hey john or how's sean and that's it you know and and he loved that ability to just walk around and not feel like you're you know being put upon so uh, that that's like a that's a luxury to me and i and it's just my personality you know some people I can't speak to other people's ability to fend off the desire to be famous. But when I see this shit and I go, I want to be famous, I say to myself, well, maybe it's just that I'm older, but like, you really don't want to be famous. Trust me. You don't really want to be famous. I mean, this is how famous I am, Daniel. I know this is like a long answer, but Tony Danza, Tony Danza was asked this question. He goes, oh, you're a real celebrity. What's it like to be famous? He goes, I'm famous enough to get a, a, a restaurant reservation and get a good doctor. Meaning he can go, I'm Tony Danza, and, and that's exactly how I can. I can call up in New York, say I'm so-and-so from Twisted Sister, get a good restaurant reservation if I need medical assistance. And, 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 it, and, 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 and people are having trouble getting appointments. I can say I'm so-and-so. And I can get I can get an appointment. I'm sorry. Let me just. This is me, and I'll just um. And, and so um. So that's it. That's fame enough for me. I don't I don't need more. I don't know. I don't need people coming up to me in airports and you know, shit like that. I don't need it. Hey guys, thanks for watching. If you like this video, make sure to subscribe for more because there is a lot more to come. All the videos on my channel are original. I'm the one filming, editing, and conducting all the interviews. So if you guys like what you see and you want to support, the best way to do so is honestly just to subscribe. Thanks for watching.